The Fantasy Skirmisher. Welcome back to The Fantasy Skirmisher. On today's video, uh, we're going to take another look at Dungeon Saga, specifically The Adventurer's Companion. The Adventurer's Companion expansion uh, provides a lot of different options for different ways to play Dungeon Saga. So a lot of things that maybe you felt was missing in the core game, which is a great self-contained game, um, is provided here. So this allows you to uh, play the game Saltair or cooperatively uh, to create random dungeons and populate them, uh, including with things like traps. It allows you to create custom characters of different races that are provided in the Mantic world of Kings of War. It also um, provides for a campaign system uh, where you can visit different locations um, in between dungeon delving uh, as a way to level up, gain experience, and uh, have little mini adventures. So with that said, let's take a quick look at the components. Uh, as you can see, the bulk of the components are the cards. Uh, the Adventures Companion greatly expands uh, the magical items, uh, such as, you know, Gleaming Blade here. So you get a lot more variety. Um, and it has uh, event cards. Uh, event cards is a, um, shows you how to populate um, dungeons that you create uh, using Uncharted Dungeons, which are, shows the tiles and which way they're placed and where the doors go and where the creatures go and where furniture or treasure chests go. Uh, then if you want to play Solitaire, you've got the Invisible Overlord. So this gives you the instructions on how to run uh, the monsters uh, that are in the dungeon. And then it has a repeat set of Overlord cards. Here I have uh, the ones from my core set, uh, which includes the Necromancer cards. So um, you can see with the symbols here, with the, um, the Fist or the Gauntlet, uh, those are just the basic core uh, cards and then with different expansions, whether it's uh, necromancy or orcs and goblins or the dragon, you could put in uh, the specific cards for the overlord. Uh, greatly expands the spells uh, to include different schools of magic, and uh, you could determine that by the top here. Uh, this is doesn't have a school of magic. This is a basic spell, but you can see this one here. Um, says it's a divinity spell from the Divinity School of Magic, and that helps you when you create a wizard. You could pick um, a school of magic where that's the key focus. Um, the game introduces traps, um, also the locations I mentioned for campaigns where you can visit different places, and it has song cards uh, if you decide to create a bard. The game also includes a pad of character sheets, so you could create custom characters like we are going to do. And then, of course, is this hot mess of a rule book. So this book, um, what can I say? It's all over the place. <laughs> and uh, it's very vague. Um, not all the ideas are fleshed out. It's difficult to kind of find specific rules or interpret rules uh, in this because I think it tries to do too much in a very disorganized way. and. In fact, I went to Mantic's website and you could download um, their errata and FAQ for the Adventures Companion, which is 14 pages long. Kid you not. So let's go ahead and uh, create our characters and let's, uh, we'll set up a dungeon and we'll play through and uh, see how it works for us. The first thing we need to do before we start our campaign is create some heroes. Uh, we could choose uh, the pre-made ones that come in the core set or one of the expansions, but the largest section in the Adventures Companion is how to make custom characters. So that's what we're going to do. So the first thing we need to do is choose a race, um, which could be human, dwarf, elf, halfling, glade walker, naid, salamander, or sylph. And then we go to the race section. So the party I'm going to make are all humans uh, because there are going to be uh, bazillions, if I pronounce that correctly, uh, that are from my uh, Kings of War Vanguard skirmish game. So you'll see in the human section, it has a racial feat um, that you write down on your character sheet, uh, also um, what ability, which is uh, versatile, 
and then your starting stats. And you write these down in pencil because they will be modified uh, depending on your profession. So starting stats for a human is seven move, two combat dice, one defense, and then um, your health tracker uh, looks like this with only one white um, health spot right there. So after you do that, uh, what you do is you choose a profession. And there's a variety of professions uh, such as barbarian, bard, cleric, demon hunter, druid, fighter, paladin, thief, and wizard. So let's move over to the profession section. And I'm going to look up fighter. And as you can see here, in the fighter profession, there's three different types of fighters. So you have um, the standard warrior, a ranger, and dervish with all the modifications. So you take those modifications you take the basic stats of the human, which you wrote down on your sheet and pencil, and then you modify them. So for the warrior, it's minus one move, plus two combat, and plus three uh, to the defense dice, and you get two more white spaces uh, for your health tracker. And then you've got your stats for the character. So after that, what you do is um, you add your racial feat and uh, the ability, like I mentioned, and then you um, choose a bonus and you have a few different options to choose from. One is you could um, do a plus one move uh, to your character or you can have the character get plus three gold uh, and you could use the gold in locations uh, during your campaign because uh, a lot of them uh, do require gold. And then uh, you could choose one magic item um, from the deck of items, magic items. And if you're a spellcaster, you could choose one additional spell that you don't know that's from your school of magic uh, that you do know. And then uh, you could choose one additional song card that you don't know if you're a bard. So those are the different options you could choose from. And then finally, uh, you create a name. So let's go ahead and introduce uh, our, our party. So my party are Basileans, like I mentioned, and here is my fighter. Her name is Zorina, a level zero human. And here you can see her stats that have been modified, uh, plus um, her official portrait. Uh, as you can tell, I have not progressed past like second grade art. Uh, then the abilities, the racial ability, uh, versatile, and uh, feats. And then I just referenced the page numbers in the rule book so I could look up what those um, feats and abilities are. All right, now we have Aldea, and she is a ranger. So in case you're confused by my artwork, that is a hood, not hair, uh, with her stats. And then I have a paladin. So he is holy, he has spellcaster uh, from the Divinity School of Magic, and the one spell he knows, and he'll have the spell card, is uh, healing. And there's his stats. And then finally, uh, we have Celestia, a human wizard. Also, not to be confused with hair, that's a hood. And she's also a spellcaster, like I mentioned, from the Divinity School of Magic. Because, you know, this uh, um, race of humans are very religious, from my understanding. I don't know a lot about the Mantic uh, world, but uh, I do know they're kind of a, a religious lot. And uh, as you can see, she is uh, mostly unpainted. I need to get her finished up, but I uh, wanted to use her uh, for the game here. Um, and one last thing about these, um, you'd be better off printing on Board Game Geek a fan-made version of this. Uh, because it does not have space for uh, gold, it does not have space uh, for the shooters if it's long or short range. Um, also, it does not have space for uh, a section for tracking glory. And you'll, you need these things. So um, these sheets um, <laughs> are not the best. I would just go to Board Game Geek and uh, download and print up some fan-made ones.
Now the next thing we need to do is of course you know set up our dungeon. So first thing we're going to do is uh, separate the cards uh, by their letters which is uh, A through H. And then you shuffle each pile and then you draw one card from each pile. And then you shuffle the deck that you just created, your hand. And so this is, so after you do this, you just um, take the top four cards, and this is your dungeon. While the standard dungeon size is four cards, um, the rules say you can um, remove or add a card just to change the size of the dungeon to your liking. And since this is uh, a new game for us with level zero heroes, I'm gonna do just that and uh, take one of the cards and put it back. And then we uh, put our heroes on a two by two uh, tile. Uh, so that way that's their starting point. We then take uh, one of the Uncharted Dungeon cards, the top one, take a look at it, and we build this dungeon with our heroes starting with the red arrow. So here we have our dungeon. Uh, so the red dots is where um, enemy models, the monsters, um, could possibly set up. But what we need to do is we need to set up where the doors are. So we roll a die and we set up um, a door or doors depending on the roll. So let's go ahead and do that now. And rolled a two. So that is we need to set up three doors right here. Um, that way we need to exit through one of these uh, doors here. So let's go ahead and get that set up. We have the doors placed and the next thing we need to do is to turn over an event card to see if there's any map traps. So we took a, take a look. Uh, there is no map traps as you can see here. And I do want to point out where it says the heroes win if. Uh, for the Solitaire game we're ignoring this. Uh, this is if you're playing with an overlord uh, with the Uncharted dungeon so that way you have a secret win condition for the players. Alright so this gets discarded. And we now draw another event card to uh, determine how many levels um, that of creatures that we're going to place on the map, uh, which we have eight. With our eight levels, we have some choices to make. So looking at the undead section in the uh, bestiary, uh, we have, for example, skeleton warriors. They cost one level each. Uh, skeleton archers cost two levels each, so on and so forth. We've got eight levels to work with. Uh, but the rules say we go up to a total or max of four uh, models to put in the dungeon. Now the rules also say that we have to just use one line only. So for example, we could have four skeleton archers, which the core game does not have. I guess that's why they want you to buy the um, expansion packs. Uh, but I think that's a stupid rule where you can't uh, have you know warriors or archers together or even you know giant rats or spiders or bat swarm. Uh, why can't you mix those up? So our house rule that we're going to do is that you could buy any creatures from any bestiary that makes sense to you, you know, as long as you uh, fall within that, you know, that level range uh, per the card. So what we're going to do is we are going to place uh, three spiders, because spiders cost two levels each, and one armored zombie. And as you can see here, this is our choices, the red dots of where we could place them on the map. So I think I'm going to place a spider here. Place a spider here. Place the armored zombie right here. And we have one left. I think what we'll do is we'll place the other spider right there. All right, now we're ready to play. The turn sequence is each hero uh, performs their actions uh, in any order that you choose. And then um, in between hero actions, you draw an invisible overlord card to see if there is an interrupt, meaning that the uh, invisible overlord could take a turn in between heroes turns. Zorina, my human fighter, is going to move first. She moves diagonally into the space here and is going to attack the spider. The spider has uh, three 
combat dice. And Zorina has four combat dice. And there's no modifiers here. So we're going to roll the dice and see how she does. So four and three and one for the spider and six, four, three, and three. So it looks like uh, got three hits and went through. So the, the sixes cancel each other out and the four hit went through as did the three as did the one because the spider has an armor of one and the spider has two wounds uh, we inflicted three hits so this spider is dead now what we're going to do is draw an invisible overlord card to see if there's an interrupt and as you can see there is not so we have the second hero action next i'm going to uh, activate azra my paladin and it's helpful if you uh, have the Necromancer Overlord panel handy uh, if you're using, of course, the Undead uh, models from the core game. Uh, so the Paladin is going to move in and attack the Spider. Uh, so I've got uh, Spider's three attack dice to the Paladin's four attack dice. There's no modifiers. The dice are rolled and the Paladin rolled really well, but then again, so did Oh, wow. So did the spider. All right, so the paladin only got one hit on the spider. So we need to place a wound token. And there we go, wound token. Now we draw another invisible overlord card, see if there's an interrupt. And there is not. It is now another hero phase, and I think we're going to activate... Uh, our ranger here, uh, Aldea, and I think what she's going to do is take a shot at that armored zombie. So the armored zombie has three armor, uh, rolls two dice, and she shoots. What is her shoot? Here we go. She has uh, three dice. All right, so now we're going to roll. Again, no modifiers. So these two are feeble dice. Uh, this one hit goes through. And so one hit is uh, on an armored zombie is no effect. We're not doing too well. So now we draw another invisible overlord card. No interrupt. So now we just have Celestia or Spellcaster. Before moving Celestia, I think I am for a second action going to move our ranger here, uh, one, two, three, four. That way she's got a nice clear line of sight going down this way and she's uh, protected. Now back to Celestia. I mentioned at the beginning of the video that her school of magic was divinity, but that is not correct uh, because divinity is reserved for uh, clerics only. Therefore, I chose uh, pyromancy and there's a process where you take the pyromancy cards and also the um, minor uh, magic cards, the minor petty magic cards, and you mix them up, you draw six, you choose um, three, and then you could choose an additional card uh, as part of the, you know, as part of the uh, character building. So anyway, the cards I have is Shield, Inferno, Flame Bolt, and Dissolve Ward, uh, which will help us pick any magic uh, treasure chests or open magical doors. Celestia is going to cast Flame Bolt and she's gonna do it uh, at the Armored Zombie. Uh, so this uh, the target suffers two dice magic magical attack. So she's gonna roll two dice and the Armored Zombie gets two fight dice. So we roll and So you can see here the uh, armored zombie has an armor of three. So one hit goes through, one hit again is no effect. All right, so that is the hero's turn. It is now time for the overlords. On the overlord's turn, 
you draw two invisible overlord cards and you follow their instructions on the card one at a time. All right, so here is the first card that uh, we've drawn. And let's just quickly go over the anatomy. Uh, first is the number, and the number is how many models can activate. Uh, the threat is um, how you calculate for each hero uh, their threat level, which determines the priority for um, the overlord to target. And then uh, the type of strategy that the overlord would use, and there's several orders um, that uh, that's available. And then uh, lastly, there's interrupt, uh, which we've already covered. Now for the first card, we do not use the listed number. And in the deck, it's mostly ones, there's a few twos, and I think there's one three. Instead, what we do is we total up uh, the total level for all the heroes, and then uh, reference a chart to determine how many activations or commands the Overlord gets um, from the first card. Uh, all these heroes are level zero, and zero to eight levels uh, is two activations. So that's what we're gonna do. We have two activations, and now we have to calculate threat. So Marksman is the sharpshooter, so that would be um, our ranger here, who's the archer. And there's also another one whose threat, which is quest. I don't think quest is really relevant for the invisible overlord solitaire play. Uh, this would be a situation, uh, for example, a hero has a key that needs where you need to get through the final door to get out of the dungeon or to open up um, a needed chest or item, you know, something like that. And then um, the order is the strategy um, that the Overlord is going to attempt to use um, to, you know, to uh, battle your heroes. And we've already covered interrupt. Um, so, you know, where it's yes or no, where you play in between the hero cards uh, to see if they get a free activation. I put together a four page rule summary uh, for Uncharted Dungeons uh, Solitaire Campaign using custom heroes. And I'm going to uh, download this onto Board Game Geek so that way it's available to all you guys. All right, so um, looking at the threat. So threat is calculated by plus the hero's experience level, uh, which right now is zero. And so then plus three uh, per threat type listed on the Invisible Overlord card, and that is the Marksman, uh, which is my Ranger here. So she has plus three threat, uh, while everyone else has zero. So she is the main target. And the strategy is Surround. So Surround is move to block all exits for the heroes, but without moving adjacent to them. Blocking exits means both physically by putting a model in the way and by having the front arc they cannot move through without stopping. Models with spells or range attacks will still use them if activated after their move. The highest threat hero possible from the position move to. So really that's not relevant in our situation here. Uh, so, but she still has the highest threat so we're gonna to try to attack her. And the only one available to do this is my armored zombie who could move one and then two. So he is in the front arc um, of, of all these right here. So he's gonna go ahead and attack. Aldea has three fight dice and the zombie uh, has two. Now the zombie would normally have minus one um, fight dice, but um, you always have a minimum of two, so therefore that uh, modifier does not count. So we're gonna go ahead and roll the dice, see how the zombie does. All right, so roll to six, that beats the zombie's highest of three. And then everything else here, you see the two. Aldea's armor is two, so therefore these are gone, so there's no hit there. For the second action, the priority would be um, a model that's already adjacent to one of the heroes, and that is the spider. The spider has three hit dice, or fight dice, compared to four. And so I rolled a six, 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 four. Um, the armor is four, so the, this die is feeble. 
All right, so the spider got one hit on my paladin, who is wounded. So I take uh, one of these, and I place it uh, on his mat there. There we go. So right there. Now if I got two more wounds, uh, and these are red, uh, that means I use one less dice in my uh, activations. Now let's draw the second Invisible Overlord card. Uh, says the number of models we can activate is two, but we only have one left. Uh, and that's this spider right here. Uh, the threat is the spell caster, uh, which the spider cannot get to. The order is gang up, and so let's take a quick look at what uh, gang up is. All right, so gang up. Moves so that as many models as possible can fight the hero with the highest threat. When there is no more room, do the same, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so another situation. This is a very tight um, dungeon section right here. And the spider um, can only move to here uh, without and has to stop because um, it's in the paladin's front arc. So it's going to attack, and I'm going to get one less dice because of the spider's support. All right, so it's going to be three dice versus three dice. And the dice is rolled. All right, Paladin did okay this time. So these are all feeble attacks uh, that the spider did because it's uh, less than uh, the uh, armor of my Paladin. And that's that. Now we're just going to speed up play here and we're just going to pretend that uh, we, after a tough fight, uh, defeated the enemies and we decided that we are going to move up to this door right here uh, to open it up. And so we're all kind of positioned. Let's just, I guess kind of like that. I think that looks good. And so now we move to adjacent to the door. We have to determine what type of lock and if it has a trap. So we take an event card. Uh, to look at the lock type and also to see if the lock is trapped, which we draw a second card uh, to determine that. Uh, and the lock is not trapped. All right, so I need to find the appropriate lock and I'll be right back. All right, so you'll see two symbols uh, for the locks. Uh, this is the lock picking uh, symbol. So if you have a thief that has the lock picking ability, um, then they could use this uh, um, to be able to reduce it uh, by one each time they um, use an action uh, for the lock picking ability. And then, of course, this should look familiar to you if you watched my last video. Uh, this is the defense strength and how many uh, fight dice that the uh, door rolls. We just need one success uh, to be able to force the door open. All right, so rolling the dice. And it was not a success. Oh, well, so we need to get to the next turn. But in the meantime, our paladin uh, is going to cast healing to remove that one wound. And a new turn, so we roll the dice again. And still, yep, yeah, oh, still no success. Wow, maybe the third time's the charm. Nope, maybe the fourth time's the charm. Finally, door is knocked down and we have a new dungeon that we build. And we're not gonna play through this whole dungeon. I'm just going to point out um, another concept or two. We drew a new card and this is what it looks like. I rolled the dice and I rolled a two. So two doors. I'll go here and here, as you can see on the map. And then the next thing we need to do is draw an event card to see if there's any uh, map traps. And as you can see, it says map traps, yes. All right then. So here's where things get a little wonky. 
and uh, it's just another issue with this game. So what you do is, these are trap tiles. Uh, we're just going to draw three randomly. Uh, not every tile is a trap. It could be a false trap. And then what you're supposed to do is place them in the red areas where it's got the uh, red dots there, which is where the um, models go. So you could see that we've already got two less areas because of the doors, leaving us with one, two, three, four spaces left. So if I place these down, what happens is I've got one space left to spawn you know, a monster. And that's just ridiculous and stupid. Um, I double check the rules and yes, you are supposed to put the door on the tiles themselves. Yeah, I want to think you should be able to house rule this where it's on the side. So that way you could put a trap right in front of the door, which would kind of force a hero to interact with it. But no, nope, I double check the rules and that's not the case. So I think in this situation, since this is kind of a sandbox type of uh, expansion and you need to treat it as such that we're just going to say heck with this we are not placing any maps um, if you're not doing the solo um, you know invisible overlord perhaps you know the overlord player himself could decide where to put the uh, trap tiles which forces the heroes to interact with them but there's nothing like that in the rules and it's a little you know frustrating to be honest Okay, so we've got this placed. We are not doing the map tiles just because, or the map traps because it doesn't make any sense. And let's just say that uh, they go through. As you can see, there's no, this is just a hallway. There's no um, furniture to interact with, no treasure chest to open. So they're just going to go ahead. And like before, open the door after they killed a bunch of monsters here, right? All right, so then we have our last card that we're going to interact with. So after the Battle of the Corridor, we uh, are able to open the door, and this is the last uh, card of our dungeon. So we have this set up here. So as you can see, we have the sarcophagus, and we have two treasures. I have a house rule, which is in my um, rule summary sheet. That since this is the last dungeon card, there are no doors that come down, you know, because you know the goal is just to wipe out all the enemies, and so therefore um, we've got not one, but two treasures that we could open for our hard work. Uh, but also, since this is the last tile, we also have a boss. So we'll just say it's a necromancer, uh, which you know the necromancer would you know be one of the uh, of the monsters. Or creatures in here and then we do battle uh, we win you know and uh, we all high five congratulate ourselves and now it is time for downtime what is downtime well that's part of the campaign system where we could go to the tavern we can go to market and we could also visit a special place so let's take a look at that now all right let me screech on the brakes here and back up just a little bit uh, just to talk a little bit more about uh, traps. So let's just say for uh, giggles that we have um, you know traps set up here because the event car said yes, set up map traps. And so we did. And let's just say that uh, our careless uh, warrior here, uh, she stepped up on this trap here. And so Zarina now has to interact with it. Uh, it's turned over. And that is a sticky trap. So now uh, the hero that triggered the trap is unable to move for the remainder of this round. They fight and shoot at minus one dice in addition to any other modifiers. At the end of the round, roll one dice. On a two to six, they break free. On a one, they remain stuck for another round. So you kind of get the idea of the traps here. Uh, so let's see what this one is. Okay, well, it's nothing. And then this other one here in the corner, it is a pit. 
So you kind of get the idea of traps, and you also kind of get the idea that there's no reason, since you know where the traps are for, you know, one of your heroes, to, to, step, to step on it. And there's no combat rules where, you know, if a combat is won, you're still alive, that you can get pushed, like, into a trap. That would be cool. You know, kind of like uh, what happens in Frostgrave. You know, you could always force, you know, an enemy one inch away if you win a combat. But that's not the case here, so traps... Uh, the map traps, I should say, are pretty worthless. Um, now, as far as the lock traps, that's another story because you have to interact with this chest and you have to draw a card to see, oh, lock trap, yes, if, if there is a trap. And so that is cool, but the map traps, in my opinion, are kind of worthless and take up precious space, uh, which should be reserved for your monsters. Okay, back to downtime. During your downtime, the first thing you do is you remove any wound tokens because your heroes uh, heal up. And then um, each one gets a one gold each. So my paladin now has a three from three to four and all the other heroes got their first gold. Then um, the heroes could keep one magic item that was found in the dungeon. If there's anything in excess that has to go back to their patron uh, by patron, um, meaning maybe the king or a baron that hired them to do the job. Uh, so we had those two treasure chests. Uh, one was a healing potion. One was a random draw, which is a silver bow. They've got one item each, so there's no problem, nothing we have to give back. And even if we had more, you could trade with other heroes. So I don't really ever see this being an issue. Um, then what you do is you calculate your hero's experience. So to do this, um, each hero gets one glory. So in the space that I made for glory, we write out one glory. Uh, this is going to allow us to level up. But first, we need to visit a location. So I put out the tavern in the market because uh, we could visit that. I've shuffled these cards. And you draw as many cards as you, has, as you have heroes. And we have... A blacksmith, thieves' den, fighting pits, and a shrine. We're going to run through the rest of our downtime steps with the paladin. So he's collected his gold, he uh, healed from his wounds, and now it's time to visit some locations. So the first thing that uh, he is going to do is he's going to visit the tavern. The tavern, as it says here, is a friendly and welcoming alehouse. And then what you do is you just roll a die and see what happens. So this is very similar to uh, the locations in the board game Talisman. So he, he's in the tavern. We're going to roll a die. i uh, rolled a three. Uh, three to six is many songs will be sung of the hero's amazing exploits and even more about his amazing luck at cards. Gain one gold. So we just went from four to five gold. Great. Now we can go to the market and spend it. So the market here, basically you shuffle the magic items and randomly lay out three uh, to form the market. Uh, you could also choose um, to buy up to three healing potions and three power one energy crystals in addition to the things that you lay out. So we're going to lay out uh, three cards at the market here. We've got a Scroll of Negation, a Oozing Blade, and a Potion of Miracles. Uh, the Potion of Miracles, the cost is right here, the coins. It costs four gold, he has five. Uh, but the hero immediately removes all wound counters from his hero card. That is pretty cool. So we're gonna go ahead and purchase that, uh, which brings him down to one gold. Uh, he's not gonna buy anything else. All right, so we have one other location we could visit. Uh, he doesn't need to go to the blacksmith or the thieves' den or the fighting pits. That's kind of out of character for a paladin, but a shrine is not. So this says a small local shrine is simple and rustic and feels all the more holy for that. So this hero is now blessed because he visited the shrine. So in the next adventure, they may re-roll all their dice in any single attack or defense roll. They must choose to re-roll all or none of the dice, and this works only once. So I'm going to go ahead and mark um, Shrine on my hero card. That way I know I got it for use uh, in the next adventure. 
Now, each hero gains one glory uh, for winning the adventure. So he has one glory, so in from zero to one. And if you look at the uh, hero level table, one glory moves him up to uh, level one. And this um, allows um, him to level up. And so there's a couple options here. What you could do is you could take gold equal to the level you just reached, meaning one gold, that's not very good. Uh, or you could learn an ability. And so there is a couple options for abilities. And let's start with the racial ability here. So this is the uh, table for human. And you can see level one, uh, you could choose dubious character. And this ability just helps you if you choose to visit the thieves' den. Again, it's just kind of out of character for the paladin. So on level one for the paladin, there's two options, hammer time and stalwalt. So we are going to choose stalwalt. And this um, symbol means it is a leveled ability. So we could choose it again for you know, stalwalt one, two, and three. So what does stalwalt do? Well, it does list the abilities here. And I need to adjust the camera a little bit. All right, so stalwalt. The model stands like a rock in combat. Each time he is the defender, he may reroll a number of dice that fail to beat his own armor. So that sounds perfect, because he could act like a tank, right? So our paladin is going to choose as an ability Stalwalt. Now, um, there is a possibility that a hero can learn a feat. Uh, so heroes we could learn a feat that depends on the level. So levels one to four, um, you, you could have one feat, which uh, he already has, uh, which is chameleon, which is the uh, racial feat. Uh, but if he moves up to um, levels five to eight, uh, you can learn two feats, and then nine to ten, three feats. So earning a feat, you know, um, is optional and counts as your experience boost for that level. So a hero cannot visit a location if a feat's chosen. And then um, all the feats are also listed, just like the abilities uh, in the Adventures Companion. And that is the downtime. So what's the verdict here? I love the idea of the Adventurer's Companion and what it's trying to do, but I can't recommend it. It has a lot of great ideas, but its potential is marred by vague errata-ridden rules. Uh, it could have been great, but I think it was rushed into production way before it was ready uh, since it was included in Mantic's Kickstarter. Now, I just want to say that this book should not be a reflection of Mantic. Mantic puts out a lot of fantastic games. Uh, this product, unfortunately, just did not meet anyone's expectations, and it's not even uh, for sale on the website. However, um, it is readily available in the second market, such as eBay, BoardGameGeek, and, and other places. All right, so a second edition, I mean, I think with proper development, playtesting, and professionally written and edited rules would elevate Dungeon Sag as a game to a whole new level. So if you're feeling adventurous, feel free to download my rule summary that's posted in the file section on the Adventures Companions uh, Board Game Geek page. All right, I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, if you did, please uh, press like. And if you like my content, also um, press a subscribe. I appreciate it. And uh, I will see you soon on the Fantasy Scripture. Bye-bye.